our goal in this series is to just get a little bit more clear of a picture of our Savior. Matthew chapter number 28, and while I pull up my notes here, uh, we are going to look at, we're going to start in verse number 28. Verse number 28. The Bible says, And when he was come to the other side in the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Are thou come hither to torment us before the time? There was a good way off from them and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the water. And they that kept them fled and went their ways into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. Today I want you to see, let's notice together, the spiritual power of Jesus. The spiritual power of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we do have to study your word. This week, as I was hearing about those in other countries who cannot gather for a worship service like this, who have to hide the fact that they know you and love you for fear for their lives, I thank you that we have the freedom today to gather, to sing loudly praises to your name. We thank you that we have you, the Word of God that we can study together. Not just study as a piece of literature, not just study as a piece of uh, wise sayings, but as the true, powerful, living Word of God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you'd meet with us now as we study. And Lord, we, we need you today. We need to hear from you. We know that if this time of this message is dependent on me, then we're in for a giant waste. But if you meet with us, if you speak to our hearts, if you take the word of God and apply it to our hearts and to our lives, then we'll walk out saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would teach us and guide us into all truth. There are people today who desperately need comfort from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're called the Comforter, so I pray that you would provide that today. There are many who need to be challenged by your word, and I ask that you would challenge and convict us and make us more like Jesus. Would you chip away the rough edges? Would you chip away at the sin in our lives so that we're more like our Savior? And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to clearly articulate uh, your intent from the word of God today. In Jesus' name. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to um, go and hear Rosslyn, Rosslyn in our church. She's a part of a choir, and their choir did a performance in the park for Juneteenth. If you're not familiar with Juneteenth, we had a great time listening uh, to the choir and getting together with people at the park, and we had a lot of fun uh, yesterday. But I learned a little, bit of, a little bit more about Juneteenth, some things that I didn't know before. So, for example, here is the story in case you're not familiar with Juneteenth. On January 1st, 1863, during the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he issued that all slaves were declared forever free. And that sounds like, and a lot of times we think about it as, hey, that's, a, that's an awesome day. And surely it was. That's a day when all slaves were declared free. But the reality is, is that when you look back on history, even though they were declared free in 1863, many people lived in slavery for the next two years. On June 19, 1865, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the Civil War was ended, 
soldiers rode down to Galveston and they declared to all the slaves in all of the region that you, the, the war is over and now you are practically free. You see, when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, people were declared free, but it wasn't until two years later until people were made practically free. And the reason why I tell that story to start the message today is that Jesus has won for you freedom. Jesus has accomplished everything that was needed. He declared at the cross that death is defeated, that Satan is bound, and that you are made free. But the reality is, is that while we have been declared free from the cross, many of us do not experience the personal and practical freedom in our everyday lives. And the reason why is because this, the powers of spiritual darkness are still fighting. They are defeated. They just don't know it yet. So today, I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 8, and I want your heart to be encouraged as we look at Jesus, and we see Jesus demonstrate his spiritual power. Jesus travels into an area called Gadara, or in this passage, it's called the area, the land, the region of the Gergesenes. When Jesus travels, he's going to encounter two, the Bible says, demon-possessed men. That is a reality that we don't like to talk about. That's a reality that we don't like to think about. But the Bible says that that is indeed a reality. There is such a thing as demonic possession. And Jesus encounters two men in Gadara, in this region of the Gergesenes, and whenever these demon-possessed men encounter Jesus, Jesus demonstrates his spiritual power. So here's the big idea of the text today. Here is Matthew's point, is that the powers of darkness are strong. There's no doubt about it. It's devastating. Spiritual darkness, spiritual evil is devastating, but it's also completely inferior to the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, I want you to notice in our text, we see the spirit, that spiritual darkness is devastating. Read with me in verse number 28. The Bible says, And when he was come to the other side in the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two men possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass this way. When Jesus gets to this land of Gadara, this land of the Gergesenes, I just want you to know, right as we get to the right as we get off the bat, that whenever I studied this out, I found out that this area of Gadara was extremely beautiful. It was an extremely beautiful area. If we could, uh, Aiden, I have a picture up there. If you could see it, this is a picture of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, this you're seeing oh, the overview. This is where Jesus walked on water. This is where on the other side, the opposite side of where you're looking. This is where Jesus called. Peter and Andrew and James and John, and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This is where uh, Peter and James and John, they were out on their boats and uh, they couldn't catch anything. And Jesus said, hey, cast your nets on the other side. And they caught more fish than their boat could handle. This is the place. But I want you to notice from this side where we're looking, the vantage point where the picture is taken from, I want you to notice the rolling hills. You can see at the bottom of the screen, the sheep. And it's just like this beautiful space. Whenever I saw it, I actually thought, about places like I've seen pictures of Scotland and Ireland, like the rolling green hills, and it's just this beautiful area. But according to the Bible, if you were a man of Gadara, if you were a person of Gadara at this time, then you, when you were traveling throughout the land of Gadara, you weren't taking in the scenes. You weren't looking, and you weren't, when you were walking, you weren't thinking, oh man, what a beautiful area. Man, just look at these hills. Look at the view of the lake. This is an amazing spot. In fact, you wouldn't be looking to take in the, the, or the, to take in the scene. You would be looking out for the maniacs of Gadara. In verse number 28, it says that when Jesus gets there into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two men possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass that way. And here, this is probably the most devastating scene that we'll see in all of the Gospels when we encounter these two demon-possessed men. Matthew talks about it, Mark talks about it, Luke talks about it, and what the Bible tells us about these two men, and just so you know, in case you're a little bit confused if you're familiar with these passages, is that in Mark and Luke, they only highlight uh, the main guy that was there, the one maniac of Gadara, where Matthew shows that there were two men that were actually there. 
But the thing that the Bible tells us about them, and just imagine this scene, just don't imagine too much, but the Bible says that these men were running around without any clothes on. Like, they're just running, uh, they've lost their minds, they're not in possession of their right mind, uh, they are running around naked, they're running around, and their home address, like if you were to ask, hey, where do you live, they would say, oh, we live in the cemetery. Now, how many of you just know that if someone's living in the cemetery, something's not right? That would be a little bit creepy, at, at like, whenever you're just walking around in the cemetery, whenever it's starting to get dark, it's a, it's a place that I don't want to hang out for very long, yet these men live in the cemetery, uh, they live in the cemetery. It says that they were in the caves with the tombs. The Bible also says that they were hurting, that they were mutilating themselves. The Bible says that they were actually cutting cutting themselves and abusing themselves and hurting themselves. And, and surely if it continued, they would end up killing themselves. Uh, we see this about them. We also see that they were a physical threat to others. Uh, all of the people in Gadara, whenever they would try to, uh, when they would try to get rid of this problem, they tried at different times. They tried to wrap them in chains. They tried to bind them, and it says that they could not do it. That, that these demon possessed men would drive them out. They couldn't be. Uh, they couldn't be constrained. They couldn't be detained. They acted like wild animals. And then it says in verse number twenty-eight, it says that so that no one could pass that way, so that no man might pass that way. Now, there's a couple of things that I want you to notice about this, about these things. So, so first of all, whenever it says, so that no man might pass by, uh, that word in the Greek literally means unable, having no power. So it's not just like they, they saw this road, they saw the way, they wanted to go in the area, and they just thought, you know, this isn't worth it. No, the way the Bible describes it is that these two men were so fierce, was that so that no one who lived in the area could even walk in that general direction. And then it says that they now not pass that way. And the word for way is actually like a highway system. Uh, if you, we, we ride around uh, Houston, we're in traffic, and sometimes you just get stuck in traffic because of one wreck. Mm -hmm. These roads were completely impassable because of these two men. This is something that is extremely devastating. It would be uh, very similar to gang territory. Like you just don't go into that area. And that is the devastation that these two men, but really these two powers of spiritual darkness were wrecking in this region. And by the way, just as we get started, I want to highlight the point that the Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So really, the enemy in this text is not these two men, it's the spiritual darkness that's possessing these two men. But I want you to notice that this is a devastating scene. This is, this is something that's hard. This is something that when you read it, it's something that uh, sends chills down my spine as I read about it, as I think about these men who are tormented and who are tormenting their region. And that is the spiritual power of darkness. And that's a reality that still is active in our world today. The Bible says that we fight against that. We wrestle against that. The Bible talks about in Jude how, how God wanted to how God was working in an area. He sent his angel to work in an area, but he was hindered. There's real spiritual darkness. There's a real spiritual reality, and it is devastating. And as I think about this, as I think about this spiritual darkness, how does that apply to my life? And I think that there's a couple of things that if I recognize this, and we need to be mindful of this church, that this is a reality. If I understand this then I have to take sin seriously. I have to take sin seriously. A lot of times it's easy in our lives for us to just think that sin isn't a big deal. It's not that, it's not that bad, it's not that important, and we like to undermine it, don't we? Like When we look at other people's sins, we like to judge other people's sins by their worst actions, but then we like to just kind of uh, sweep our own sins under the rug and give ourselves, assign to ourselves our, our best motives. But the reality is, is that spiritual darkness is serious. It's serious. Yet so often we don't treat it that way. I saw this video. It was on YouTube. There was this journalist. And this journalist went to, I don't remember where he went, but he got to see this man who kept a pet lion. He kept a pet lion, so he wanted to go see it, and he was writing a story on it. And he actually got into the cage with this pet lion. So there's the owner, he has the lion, and, and he's showing him to the journalist, and the lion is just kind of playing around, but then, the, but then the lion got his leg, got the journalist's leg, if I remember right, and then it was like the lion, like it was like he smelled blood. Yeah. 
Because as soon as he did that, the lion wasn't really doing anything. But as soon as he got like a, a grab, a hold of his leg, the lion immediately went for the guy's neck. Uh, he, tried to, he tried to kill the guy. Uh, the owner's trying to fight him back. He's trying to stay away. And for the next several minutes, they're trying to fight this lion off of this guy. And, and he ended up surviving. But the reality is, is that's a lot like sin. A lot of times we treat it like a pet, like it's, it's not a big deal, it's not important, it's not serious, but as soon as it gets a hold of us, if we're not careful, we're going down. We're going down. Uh, I will take sin seriously. If, if I understand that sin is a reality, that spiritual darkness is a re- reality, then I will recognize the deceptive nature of my own heart to suck me into darkness and grow colder to Jesus. The reality is there's a song, one of my favorite songs about this. The song goes like this. There's a verse in it that says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What's amazing about that song, it's an old hymn, come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. And then in the song, he writes about the, the own tendency, the own proneness of our hearts to wonder. What's, what's sad about the story is that the man who wrote it later in his life, he actually left the faith for a season. He knew what he was talking about. My heart is prone to wonder. And if we understand that sin is serious, then we will recognize that our own hearts are prone to wonder from the Lord. And we'll take that seriously. If I understand that this is reality, then in my struggle with sin, I will seek the community of the church instead of drifting into isolation. Because so often we can't fight sin by ourselves. We can't fight sin by ourselves. Spiritual darkness is a reality. Spiritual darkness is devastating. But the second truth that I want you to know is this. Spiritual darkness is inferior to Jesus. Spiritual darkness is inferior to Jesus. I want you to look with me in verse number 29. It says, behold, they cried out. That word cried out is an uh, exclamation. Uh, It means either terror or a surprise of joy. Uh, this week I was sitting with Witten and Witten was just sitting with me in the chair and then I turned on for him his favorite show, uh, Disney Junior, Spidey and His Amazing Friends. And as soon as the theme song came on, like my son, he's just, he's just sitting, he's just chilling. And then all of a sudden the song comes on and he like jumps, he leaps out of my lap and he goes, go, go, go. <laughs> That's not the kind of exclaiming. That's not the kind of crying out that these demonized men are shouting when they come to Jesus. They're, they are in terror before him. They're saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And I find this verse so interesting. This verse 29 so interesting is because they come, they're running, they're screaming because they are in the presence of Jesus. And the way that one The way that one author wrote about this, he says they're running towards him, but at the same time, they're repulsed by him. At one point, they're coming down and they're bowing down before him in worship, but at the same time, they hate him. That's the way that these demons are interacting with the Lord Jesus, and they come to him and they bow down before him. And the Bible says that they worship him and they say, Lord, are you here? Jesus, are you here to cast us out before the time, to torment us before it is our appointed time to be tormented? There's a couple of things that are really interesting about this text. One, in last week's passage, you remember last week, whenever Jesus went with his disciples across the Sea of Galilee, they get caught in a storm and the disciples say, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They have this question, hey, who is this? And then the demons come and they actually know. By the way, that's an interesting point. James talks about it. He says that even the devils, even the demons, they believe and they tremble. Uh, knowing about him, knowing who he is, and actually loving him are two different things. Those are two different things, but they come before him and they say, are you here to torment us before the time? And a lot of people get distracted with that because that's something that's just, uh, it's very interesting, isn't it? That they say, hey, there is a future reality where we are going to be tormented. And a lot of people spend a lot of time saying like, what do they mean by that? Like what, what's going on here? What's up with this torment? Here's the point. Here's the point. They were beaten, they were defeated, and they knew it. Can I just tell you something, church? Can I encourage you with something? That whenever it comes to spiritual warfare, whenever it comes to spiritual battle, a lot of times, I know this in my life, a lot of times we look at spiritual dark, at the battle of spiritual darkness versus light, the devils versus God, and we look at it like it's an even match. We look at it like it's an even contest almost. 
Like, hey, you know what? I believe that Jesus is going to win, but, but the devil's going to get in his licks. But the reality is, is that they, as they come before Jesus, they don't come in thinking that they have a shot. They know that they are defeated. I've told you the story before about whenever I first started playing, when I first started playing basketball, that we were terrible. We lost our first game 70 to 12. And a little bit into our season, a, a few weeks into our season, we played a team called Gospel Light. Gospel Light was, they were the best team in our state as far as Christian schools go. Uh, there was just nobody better than them. They played a lot of the big public schools uh, in our state and they beat them. Uh, they were really good. One of their guys went and I think he, he sat on the bench for Louisville, which is a big division one school. Like they were a good team. They played us and I remember our first game against them, we lost something like 120 to 30. We were no match. We were no match. And I look back on that and I was thinking, man, those guys, they were so smug. They were so cocky. And I, I hated how they, how they interacted and those kinds of things. And part of it really wasn't, probably wasn't even their fault. It was probably just me feeling bad that I got beat by 90 points. But my moment of glory, not my moment of glory, but my moment of rejoicing came a few years later. While I was in college, I found out that most of those guys that played in the high school, their church also had a college. And most of those guys played for their college. Well, we were all, all around our campus at college. We were talking about that, that Bible college because they were on ESPN. And they were on Bleacher Report. And they were on Sports Illustrated. Champion was featured on all of those major news sites because they lost to Southern University 116 to 12. In fact... ESPN put together this, this uh, they put together this list, this countdown of the 100 biggest blowouts in sports history, and they were featured at number 83. You know, we were no match for that team, but there was a lot of people that they were no match for. Whenever it comes to this battle with spiritual darkness, whenever it comes to living a life that is holy and pleasing to the Lord, can I just tell you something? That you and I may not be much of a match for the power of spiritual darkness, but spiritual darkness is no match for our Savior. It's no match for the Lord Jesus Christ. We see here in the text that they come and they know that they are defeated. They know uh, that they are going to be tormented for eternity. They know that they will suffer before God because of their rebellion against him. And could I just tell you that if I believe that that's true. So we talk about if spiritual darkness is, is a reality, if, if the enemy really what seeks to kill, to steal, and to destroy, if he really wants you to live a life that is not pleasing to God, then we have to take sin seriously. But also if I believe that sin is inferior to Jesus, that sin, that Satan is defeated before our God, then I can serve him with confidence. I can serve him with joy. I can serve him with faith. I can serve him with peace. I can live a life that is holy and pleasing to God, not because I am so strong, but because he is so strong. Not because I am so amazing, but because he is so amazing. Whenever we put our confidence and our trust and we try to rest in ourselves, we fall and we fail. But whenever our trust is in the Lord, as Psalm says all over, he is our shield and our buckler. He's our defender. He's our foundation. He is our strength. He's our protector. That is who our God is. We can wage war as a church in our community, uh, a war of, for the gospel, a war for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and love because we are on the winning side. We fight not for victory. We fight from victory because of the cross of Jesus, because of what he has done for us. So I want you to notice that Sin is devastating, and it needs to be taken needs to be taken seriously. Spiritual darkness is inferior to Jesus, so I can live with confidence and with joy. We don't live in fear of sin; we live in the fear of the Lord. Uh, we trust Him. Uh, we don't. I love the way that that somebody put it one time: is that whenever we get so caught up with how bad sin is, and we just focus on that all the time, then what we end up doing is oftentimes we inadvertently worship it. 
It ends up taking the focus of our heart. It takes the throne of our heart when we focus on how bad the devil is or how bad sin is. And it needs to be taken seriously, but our affection has to be for the Lord Jesus. Our focus has to be on the Lord Jesus. If we focus on darkness, our hearts will grow darker. If we focus on Jesus, then we'll be filled with light. Spiritual darkness is inferior to Jesus, but finally I want you to notice that spiritual darkness is defeated by Jesus forever at the cross. Spiritual darkness is defeated forever by Jesus at the cross. Jesus casts out the demons. And the demons, they say to Jesus, hey, will you cast us into the pigs? And a lot of people uh, get caught up with why did Jesus, like I can't just skip that, right? It would be easy for me to skip that part. And then all of you would become, some of you would be coming to me after and it's like, well, Pastor, what about the pigs? What about the pigs? A lot of people, like people read this and people read this all the time. And then the first question, like if you just type up, I'm sure if you Googled pigs and Jesus, like this is going to come up. And all of them are going to say, why did Jesus do that to the pigs? Why did Jesus do that to the pigs? Why did Jesus do that to the pigs? You ready for this? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know why Jesus did that to the pigs. Uh, Here's a couple of things. One, I don't think that Matthew's purpose was for us to walk away from this text saying, man, what about those poor pigs? (laughs) The purpose is to see how awesome Jesus is. That's the purpose of this text. To see how Jesus is so much stronger than the powers of darkness. There's a couple of theories on it, and I'll give it to you uh, for your benefit. One is that if these people were Jewish, then raising pigs was something that was for them unholy. These were unclean animals that Jews were forbidden from handling and raising and eating. So in a sense, Jesus could have been cleansing the area. Another thing that I think is really the biggest thing from this text is that whenever it comes to a herd of pigs, in comparison to these two men, Jesus is going to pick these two men every time. In Matthew 6, Jesus says that your father keeps watch over the sparrows. He knows them by name. He knows each one. He knows when one falls. But aren't you so much more valuable than them? Here Jesus is demonstrating how much he loves and how much he cares for even these demonized men. So let your heart be encouraged that you cannot be too far from God. You cannot mess up too much uh, to not be loved by God. God loves and if God loved and cared for these demonized men, then he loves and he cares for you. He loves and he cares for you. He casts out the demons, they go into the pigs, the pigs go off and uh, they drown themselves in the sea. And then the, the text closes, and really this is just amazing to me. The text closes by saying that the people who experience this, the people who witness Jesus' miracle, they go into the city, they tell everyone about it. It tells us about this in Mark and Luke that they go out and they say, hey, this is what Jesus did. And they focus on, they tell them about the demons and they tell them about the pigs. But their focus is on what Jesus did for the men. Jesus cast them out. And that sounds great, right? That sounds amazing. Like, hey, Jesus is getting glory. They're shouting out, hey, this is what Jesus did. Jesus drove out these demons. Uh, Jesus delivered these two men. And you'd be saying, hey, like, let's just, let's close it there. Let's celebrate. Let's rejoice that Jesus won this victory. And all the region heard about what Jesus did. But that's not how the story ends. Here's how it ends. They hear about what Jesus did. And then they all approach Jesus. And they ask Jesus to leave. They ask Jesus to leave. Here's the reality. Jesus came into the region to declare victory. He came to declare freedom. He made it available. But the choice was for each and every individual whether they would receive it or not. Can I just tell you something? That Jesus is a powerful and he's a wonderful Savior. He can give you freedom from sin. He can grow you into the likeness of his son. But how we grow, the speed in which we grow, part of that is is on us. How are we going to respond? Not are we going to try to buckle our bootstraps up tighter and try to pull ourselves up, but are we going to respond in faith? 
to the victory that Jesus has won? Or are we going to say, thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. That was the response of these people. But this is a foreshadowing in Matthew chapter 8 that Jesus is greater. We've seen so far Jesus is greater than disease. We've seen that Jesus is greater than nature. And now we see that Jesus is greater than demons. He's greater than spirit, the spiritual darkness of our world. And he offers freedom to you and to me. So the challenge for us is will we believe that and will we live in that? If I believe that this is true, if I believe that Jesus has won the victory for me through his death on the cross, if I believe that, then I will remind myself of the gospel every day. I will remind myself that I'm in a spiritual war. I'm in a spiritual battle. But because of the resurrection, I'm fighting from victory and not for it. If I believe that Jesus won the victory for me and that he's greater than the powers of sin that wants to entangle me, then I'll put on the, the armor of God each day. Ephesians 6 talks about the spiritual armor that we wear. It's not our armor, it's his armor. The Bible says, be strong, not in yourselves, but it says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If I believe that, then I'll put on this spiritual armor. And by the way, the spiritual armor is the message of the gospel. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness that is given to me, the belt of truth, the, the, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It is the good news, it is the message of the gospel. If I believe that this is true, I will submit my fear and my anxiety to Jesus because nothing is stronger than him. Nothing is stronger than him. So church, let me encourage you. Let me challenge you. The message is simple today. Sin is strong. Jesus is way stronger. Sin may be too strong for me. It may knock me down from time to time, but it's got nothing on him. It's got nothing on him. So let's be a people. Let me just challenge you this week. Every day this week, would you get up in the morning and would you remind yourself of the truth of the gospel? That Jesus won freedom for you and you can live a life glorified, that glorifies him, not because of your own effort, but because of his power at work in you. Let's remember that this week. Let's live in that this week and let's experience the freedom that Jesus offers. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you for the freedom that is available to us in Christ. You said in your word that unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keep watch, the watchman wakes in vain. Father, I pray and ask that you would help us as a church to be people who truly believe the gospel and live in the power of of the resurrection. You said in Ephesians 1 that the power of the resurrection is at work in us. We don't take credit for that. We know that's not because we're so special. But because you are. So Lord, I pray that you ask that you help us to live, to live in that. In Jesus' name. If you would please keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. Keep your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. And take some time to respond to the truth of the gospel today. So I have a couple of questions for you. The first question is this. Have you not been taking sin seriously? Have you been acting like it's not a big deal? Could I challenge you to repent of that? Have you ever been treating sin as deadly? And call out to God and wage war wage war on the sin in your life today. The next point of application is, are you, are you relying on the gospel in your everyday living? He won the victory for you. He won the victory for you, so you trust him. Trust him and live for him. Take a moment there in your seat to pray and respond to God, and then I'll close in prayer and we'll stand this in your own song.
Father, we come before you, and I thank you for the truth of your word today. I ask that you would enable us as a church to, uh, that you would help us individually to recognize and remember that we are in a war every single day. But you are greater, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Lord, we ask for your help in our everyday lives. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit. Would you allow to come out of us the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control that can only be produced by you? Lord, would you help us to live in victory this week? Thank you for this time that we've had in your word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. Let's